All right, I got my friend here, Philip Lakin, who's the co-founder and CEO of No Code Ops. And we'll, uh, I think we should start just so like people get a little bit of context, right? Uh, because probably most people that are listening to this are marketers, but they're certainly interested in building communities and doing cool stuff that you're doing. But like real quick, what's No Code Ops? Who you guys, who's it for? Give us like the quick forward one there. For sure. Um, so uh, I'd started No Code Ops about two and a half years ago at this point. Uh, it really started, it just started as a newsletter because uh, in the no-code world, there was just a bunch of talk around uh, using no-code to build a company, build, you know, a micro SaaS product, build a marketplace, build your own business, essentially, mm -hmm. right? But not necessarily use it within your function at a company to upskill and uh, be become that systems person on your team without knowing how to code. And that was my journey. And so I was like, I wonder if I just like, create newsletter content about this if anyone would even read it. Uh, mm -hmm. And so that's how it started. And the newsletter grew and grew and grew and then eventually grew into a community. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, uh, which was a big transition going from like a one-way thing to a two-way mm -hmm. uh, relationship. Totally. Um, a lot of learnings there. And then, yeah, it's since evolved into also now having a software product uh, called Operator, um, uh, which we are uh, launching uh, later this summer, which is exciting, uh, which is a visibility platform for all of the automations that you run. We're starting with Zapier and giving you more insights to how Zapier connects into Airtable, but eventually more apps on both sides of that coming soon. So totally really exciting. And you guys started those like two or three years ago, right? Yeah. Yeah. About two and a half years ago. And then how many, yeah. how many people are in the community now? So we've got over 10,000 people reading our uh, newsletter, which is awesome. Uh -huh. And then, you know, people have to apply to the community. Right. Uh, so it's vetted. So uh, just around, just over 600 at this point in the community. Kick ass, man. That's awesome. It's, you know, it's always a game of like quality, right? I mean, you want the right people there, the ones that are active, that are going to engage and not just, you know, pump up numbers just to pump them up, right? Right. Uh, and we also didn't want people to feel like, so overwhelmed when coming in either yeah right? it's just exactly like, oh there's like ten thousand people barely talking to each other it's like i'd rather have like 600 really active folks right that are just really loving what we have to offer and, yeah 100 um, yeah oh agreed agreed well cool stuff well i like this thing man is because i thought it was so interesting because you guys have taken an approach that's very different from many others i mean everyone right now has been talking about community last two or three years it's like we need to start a community are we building one how do we build one should we build one on all those things and so I think it's interesting though, because most companies build product first. They do that for two or three years after raising a bunch of money. And they say, you know what, man, we really need to get a whole bunch of our customers together in community, start building our relationships with them there. And then ultimately, you know, hopefully nurture that into something where they ultimately convert and buy. Right. And so, you know, for you all though, you guys took the opposite approach where you started with community and now have built a product around that. And so I'm super interested to hear like why that took place or even, yeah. or even if it did, I mean, was that conscious at the time? Are you just like, you know what, this is kind of where we want to start. I mean, I don't, I'm not sure what we want to do in terms of the product. We just decided to get a community together and uh, so on and so forth. What, is, what does that look like? What was that decision process? So, so it was pretty conscious, right? Like, you know, very, very early on with the community, it's just like, I just want to, you know, yeah. when it was just a newsletter, it was just like, I want to find the other people and talk to them about this stuff because right. I wish I would have had this resource. Uh, yeah. Um, but then as it started transforming into community, yeah, the goal was let's build a community first and figure out product later. We knew we wanted to go the venture back route. We knew we wanted to go the software route. Um, but we also knew we didn't want to build a Zapier competitor, an Airtable competitor, right? Like, um, you know, those tools are pretty darn good at what they do. And, you know, and there's like, there's just so much going on in the space of, you know, uh, even different bends on that stuff. Like different automation platforms and different project management platforms and different database. Like there's so many folks tackling that thing and, and it's great, but what we really wanted to do is say, be agnostic to the, the platforms and say, we knew we wanted to do something in the infrastructure world to, to as no coders started upskilling and like their systems started really being relied on at larger companies. What problems did they face when using multiple tools at larger companies? Um, and we told our earliest investors, we were just like, listen, we're going to be really honest with y'all. Like, we genuinely have no idea what we're going to build. Uh, we know we have technical folks. We know we're going to build something, right? We know it's going to probably be in the infrastructure of no code side of the world. But how that expresses itself, it's going to be completely up to our community and like just working with them and all that jazz. And, um, and that's what's kind of happened, man. Like, we've just, we've really leaned in. And so 
yeah, a lot of companies do start by saying, hey, we're going to build a product that will build a community around it. And we went the total opposite way. And, you know, there are definitely some some uh, pros and cons and some like, you know, wins and learnings just like from that approach. Yeah, totally. Oh, I bet. I bet. Well, I mean, break it down. I mean, like what were like the first I mean, as soon as you guys said we're going to build a community, right? What were the first 90 yep. days, 180 days? What did that look like? I mean, what were the things you were doing? Was there a like if someone, for example, and I'm thinking about this more practically, right? If someone's out there trying to think about building a community from scratch today, yep. and you think about all the things that you did in the first, say, three, four months or so, what were those things? Where'd you start? Yeah. Uh, so I think the first thing really was find 10 people and make them really happy. Love that. Just show up for them. Like, it's not about... because. The move from newsletter to community is, it's so much harder because it's now, it, you know, people think like, oh, if I just get the right people in a space, they'll just create conversations. It's like, that is not at all what happens. Like, you've got to be a part of the conversation. You've got to host the party. You've got to show up and be there and, uh, and facilitate and, you know, push people to, you know, share their experience and create one-on-one -on -one connections with each person that then prompts them to create one-on-one -on -one connections with other people and like, you know, more engaged and like, um, and so we tried all, you know, like we tried a lot of different things, but the thing that ended up working the best was just, uh, keeping 10 people really, really happy, like a very small group of folks, uh, who were really bought in and just big on the vision, um, and getting them talking and then slowly adding people to that. Now I will say that it's not for the faint of heart and like, uh, look, it can be also a big distraction from building product. Community is its own product. It takes like a lot of time and energy and love. And the best thing we ever did on that front was bringing folks to help us. <laughs> and like now like our, you know, uh, you know, uh, we have, uh, Claudia, who's our, who's our community manager right now. And like, you know, um, it, like, like she is, it's literally her product that she's watching after. And she is in it every day, creating the events, creating connections, personally reaching out to people, inviting new people, posting content in our newsletter from our community to get more people in our community, you know, hosting like weekly jam sessions. Like that's something that as our community has now grown from like 10 to 600, that if I were to still be running and doing every day, I wouldn't have time to focus on the product in the ways that I need to. Um, and so, like, uh, uh, there's a balance piece there. As the community grows, don't be afraid to, like, bring on somebody who is really good at doing that stuff. Like, uh, just don't be afraid of it. It's a good point, because, I mean, I think, uh, yeah, to your point, people will just show up and say, yippee, I'm going to start creating tons of stuff. I mean, I know I'm part of, like, I don't know, at least five or six different communities for marketers. Uh, I mean, maybe it's a me thing, but I, it's tough to get in there all the time and, you know, create content and collaborate with people and meet people and do all these things. But I think, you know, when there's a, a call to action to get back into it, usually it's an event or someone speaking or someone doing something, then usually I'll kind of show back up and say, okay, hey, what's going on again? But I'm not just like sitting there on Slack because I've got, you know, my own Slack thread with everything Omni related, right? So it's not like right. I'm going between the five different communities, you know, all hours of the day trying to chat with all different people, right? So I think it's tough. But what's what was like the inflection point when you said, hey, we need like a Claudia or someone like her or she can really own this thing. When did you guys actually do that? I mean, you said 10, make 10 people happy, right? Was that like at 400? Was it in the beginning? When was that? Man, honestly, it was pretty early, right? Because like, yeah. you know, even early in our journey, like, um, you know, uh, it was really early, right? Like we had another community manager, Shaft, that really helped take it from like, you know, like, 10 to a hundred. Yeah. And then we had Claudia come in and take it over to like bring it to like a hundred to like where it is now. Right. And, uh, and both of them, like the, the kind of need really came from the fact that like, I knew we wanted an active and engaged community, right. That that was going to be a big part of what we were going to offer because as long as we stayed so close to the problem and showed people that like, Hey, we care way more about this overall ecosystem than just a product. Like our big mission is way more than just selling SaaS. It is like helping people make double or triple their income while not having to like take the entrepreneurial route if they don't want to yeah. within their own career path, right? Doing what they love and already know. And like, that's a, that's a big deal for us. And so 
part of that is community, part of that is education, and part of that is technology. And so, um, like, I couldn't. I, I'm pretty. I'm pretty darn active in our community, but I would never be able to like facilitate conversations in a way that somebody else could. So once it got to like about a hundred or so people, especially you know like fifty to a hundred, like. I really couldn't be the person that was like constantly priming conversations and constantly like booking new webinar guests, right? And like prepping them and then getting the recordings done and then splicing those up. Like it's just a lot of work that goes into the back end of both like managing the internal community, the engagement, Great. and then the external attraction to that and to do it well. And I, I could have done it, but then the product would have suffered. Exactly. Exactly. Well, going back to your point. So, I mean, like, so 10 people, you make 10 people really happy. Got it. You guys had Claudia from the beginning, and so she was in there really helping out, making sure that the community was getting value out of it. She was creating events, splicing content, all sorts of things. But what was the, how did you guys get the next, say, 90? I mean, what did that look like? Did those come from the newsletter? And it was about just kind of letting people know in the newsletter and just organically yeah. people just kind of came in? Or did you guys do anything else to promote it or anything on LinkedIn organically, anything like that? A lot of organic and a lot of newsletters, uh -huh. right? So... uh but the organic side came from the fact that we would talk about and create noise on social around our specific niche, right? Yep. And so we kind of, uh, we started like with that Simon Sinek thing of like the why, right? Like what is the why of totally. this thing? And for us, if you are searching for anything related to no code and operations, you should be able to find us pretty darn easily mm -hmm. and just go, that's for me. Those are my people, mm -hmm. right? Like, the best quotes we get from community members and testimonials are things like, I thought I was on an island of like misfit toys until I found you guys, uh -huh. right? Like, <laughs> I thought I was just like, you know, like, yeah. I, I felt like the odd person out of my company because like, I'm more technical than, you know, just like the average, uh, like marketer or finance person, but I'm way less technical than our devs and like, I'm always kind of in the middle. And so right. uh, when they found us, they're like, oh my God, people that want to hear about the process that I built. Right. right. Like exactly. exactly. <laughs> Are you getting me? Yeah. Um, and so starting with that, why of just like, why are we gathering these folks? Right. And, and for what reasons? Uh, and then that just infused its way into like all of our content, all of our newsletter stuff. And that would just attract people to want to talk to other people like them who had that similar why. Um, and we find often with no coders that once someone learns how to no code, they're if such an underdog spirit because they've been told they couldn't do something for so long. Mm -hmm the first thing they want to typically do is go and show others how to do this stuff. And mm. we give them a venue to do that. And like, I think that's very powerful too. That's really cool. Yeah, exactly. Cause I mean, at the end of the day, I don't think there were a lot of no code ops communities, right? Or is it a pretty competitive? There's not. There's not. So you guys are in a luxury position where people are looking for a way to get together and you guys have created that, which I think is very different than the marketing community space because there's just a zillion of them, right? So you really right. have to stand out. The only way is to really just kind of make it uber specific like all about content marketing or paid ads or a given channel or whatever it may be to get it to like be something otherwise yeah. it's like you're just another marketing community out there you know it's so funny it's like any advice that like one of the best things i could ever tell someone starting a community or starting a newsletter it's whatever is like however much you think you've niched down do it again <laughs> like mm -hmm. it's just like when people tell you like whatever you know raise your prices raise your prices raise your prices yeah and people are always uncomfortable to do it because they think that, you know, that, that it's going to have negative results and then it ends up crushing it for them. Oh, yeah. I can only tell you, niche down beyond the point of comfort. Yeah. Well, this I, is the same thing. I mean, like I, I posted about this, I think, two weeks ago, but it's the same thing where, you know, a lot of startups will have difficulty moving away from their TAM being the thing they target versus the actual ICP of today, right? And it's like your TAM is what you sold investors. It's the big opportunity. It's the vision. It's where you're going right. to go. but. Yeah, do, you're you, talking you to don't, today. Yeah, exactly. You don't take your existing budget with your one or two marketers, right? And say, yippee, we're going to go kill it and market to everyone, right? Because you're going to fall flat. And it's going to be really hard to stand out, especially if you're in an existing category. Like, I mean, if you're in CRM, right, is the common example people love to talk about. I mean, you can't be successful in CRM without niching down. It just ain't going to work, you know? Nope. So I love that. That's a good point. Well, so I guess, so we got to, in order to go like how you kind of build the community, most of it's organic, most of it's newsletter. And then in terms of like some challenges and some stuff to like for people to keep in mind with building communities, what are some like the biggest things that you guys got in a little problem with? Maybe people that weren't yeah. engaging with the community as much and how you got them back, or were there some things that you kind of said, ah, oh, man, this is really difficult. We're trying to figure out 
how to actually do this because people that maybe are not getting as much value out of this as they they need to be anything like that that ever yeah came up? i mean th- th- there's a few things one just the identity is hard in and of itself right because you know there's a lot of people out there doing no code work in their functions a lot of marketing ops people sales ops people ops people that are doing this stuff they don't know they're no code operators and they probably never even heard the term no code but that's indeed what they are and so for us one of the challenges is, was always like how do we get in front of more people to show them that they are a no coder not just people searching for no code operation stuff right it's one of the reasons we're using Omni for our first ever paid ads. There you go. Um, boom. <laughs> boom. Not a, pay, um, not a paid sponsorship. Not paid. <laughs> and we're paying for this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but like, so getting to a wider audience beyond just the people looking for, hey, I'm, I identify as a no-coder, right? Sure. To, sh- to help you understand that, hey, you're a no-coder and like, come meet other people like you. Right. Um, I think that that was, that was really important for us uh, and really a, a hard challenge. Um, but yeah, man, like uh, finding the right balance of how often do you do, uh, um, how often do you do like planned things versus serendipitous things? You know, uh, how often should like meetups be structured versus unstructured? Um, uh, what do you do when there's just like a lull of an engagement, which just like naturally happens? Um, uh, how do you re-engage with folks? Um, well, let's talk about one of those. I mean, let's talk, let's break one of them yeah. down. I mean, like, because I think the re-engagement one to me is always a big one. That's the one I constantly hear when I talk to people in communities that usually they've yeah. got a lot more competition. There's a lot more co- uh, communities out there. And so getting people back into the community and giving them a reason to come back is always tough. So like for yeah, you all, hard. like, I mean, what's the, for what's us, the answer? For us, one of the things is like, look, and you said it earlier, right? Like, you've got to have a specific reason to come into the community. It's not just like, so I think what started the community was like this enthusiasm right around like, oh my God, there's other people like me. That's like the hook, sure. but the hook is not sustainable, right? Like there's only so many times where you can just come to me and be like, I like no code and I'm an ops. Oh, you like no code and you're an ops? Yeah. I'm not the only one. You're not the only one. Uh-huh. Cool. Cool. Now what do we do? Now what do we do? Yeah. <laughs> you know? exactly. yeah. And so that's like what I call the enthusiast community problem. It's just like, it's hard to just like, like enthusiasm is not the thing that just, yeah. it's the thing that maybe no, you, have to, you have to do in, something, right? That keeps them around. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So what is that thing? And for us, I found that the more specific we get with our content, with our, uh, with our webinars, right? It's not just like, you know, how operations how no code is used in operations right like people don't really care about that like that's like a gartner report right Mm -hmm. like what people care about is like how do i use Airtable in this specific way to get a raise exactly yeah right how do i use these tools in a way or how do i get funding for these tools like what are the specific problems that you're having that you can either teach or learn about and give people a venue to do both of those things because a good host sets up a good party. And that's one thing that Claudia is freaking phenomenal at is she, she sets the stage for folks to both teach and learn in a way that uh, just, they, they weren't able to do before. And people, by the way, have both needs. They both want to learn and they both want to teach. Yeah. And, uh, and setting that stage and being specific and doing that with intention is really hard Mm -hmm. and takes time and experiments and failing. But, uh, but yeah, I, I, I would say like getting more intentional about that and understanding what people want and why, and also not being scared to say like, to, to take some risks, right? Like we took a risk around, uh, we've never done a boot camp before, right? We took a risk in like working with another company called 9X and doing like a whole boot camp on APIs. And we learned a ton from it. It took a shit ton of work and energy from our side to run an entire boot camp, right? But like, we learned a lot from it, like about more about what we want to do and not want to do, right. you know, in terms of community engagement. So, yeah, it's just it's a constant experiment. Agreed. I mean, I think the the big thing always for me is like, I guess I'm just a really practical kind of person when it comes to content. And so I'm looking for like practical things that I could potentially use. And maybe they're not perfect yeah. for my use case, but like a framework, a process, a real example, a use case. Show me what you're doing in your organization step by step. So I can maybe right. get inspiration from that 
and then do something with that related either to my work or another work. And like, I think that and, like giving specific stuff is really yep. what I think everyone wants. Because I think a lot of times communities become this like question Q&A type of thing, which I think is fine. Right. But I think there's got to be a part of it. Exactly. It's, it's just be a more part of that. it. Exactly. And so all these people are asking, hey, should I do, you know, and communities were like, hey, what should I, what should my LinkedIn ad strategy be? Or what should my Google ad strategy be? And so on and so forth. But I think it'd be great you know, little communities and segments within that Slack channel or whatever platform it's in where it's like, hey, like, yeah. here's actually what we do and here's how we do it. Because then that then sparks tons of conversation, gives people something to go right. off on. And then for me, like, I'm coming back to look at that all day long. And so if people keep coming in and delivering that type of content, yep. huge. So let me give you a perfect example there, right? Yeah. Like, uh, me saying something on social, right? Because I consider, so like, my... My, you know, like my audience on social, right? Like just as an extension of the community. Exactly. Right. In a lot of ways. Uh, and there's a lot of crossover, right? So on social, when I say something like on LinkedIn, like um, Airtable is great for this or Smart Suite is great for that or Zapier is great for this or, or something like that, right? Um, okay, that gets like some traction, you know, people are like, cool, right? Yeah. Uh, or no code, it really helped me with this. Okay, maybe a little more. But what really gets people jazzed is when I say something from the weeds, yeah. like, yo, when I'm in Airtable, all I wanted to do was have a record of all my emails associated with that contact in my CRM, but I don't want to burn through a shit ton of records. Plus, I don't want to deal with email in CRM, exactly. though I want it referenceable from there. I want email in email. So how do I fix that? And I learned that there's the, one of the ways that people do it. And I shared my screenshot of how I did it, which is exactly. like, um, Put a button in Airtable on that record, I on that record in that row that is a button that says see emails. And when you click that, it opens up a Gmail search link for the email in that record. So that's how you link the two. Killer. And that's the people love that. I love that stuff. Yeah, exactly. Because you know, it's useful. It's something you can do, right? Because I think there's like oh, right. there's a lot of theory out there and opinions and all sorts of things. And that's fine. And there's a time and a place for that. But it's like, all right, so what do I do? Show me something right. that someone else has done that you've done or give me something to right. visualize, right? And there's no like one playbook to rule them all. There's not one process to rule them all. But there's things that you can take pieces of and then adapt that to your process. And I think that's what it's all about. But um, And the, the real nugget there, right, is you know you're crushing it when your community starts doing that for each other, where your community is getting specific with each other. Yeah. Where like you are showing them like, totally. hey, this is the kind of stuff that people resonate with. Like, can you create some stuff like this? Right. Totally. Like, don't like just and I think one of the hard parts about community is getting people to realize just because you think something is easy doesn't mean that other people do. Right. And like you uh, encouraging people to share that stuff. That's like, what's one thing you find easy? So like you know, one thing we haven't even built out yet, right? That like, yeah. uh, that I want to build out over time. So future feature alert for our community, mm -hmm. right? That I think is like a great idea, right? Is like people apply to our community. So we've got all this good data on them, right? That they are submitting, right? I would love at some point to use GPT to rewrite some of that and say, hey, we've created your first post for you. Can we introduce you to the community, right? And you can add stuff to that. And just remove the friction of just like you having to introduce yourself. Love that. Right? Love that. Like, how do you just make it easier for people to engage and like just get over those hurdles? So, I don't know. That's, like, a, that's, that's a great kind of idea. You know, he's also that uh, I just saw it on Trainual's website, but Trainual actually will do that. So when you're writing SOPs and process docs or people that maybe aren't as good writing that and getting the information together. You can give it a little bit and then they're using GPT to actually prompt them a little bit just to get, you know, some of the words out there. And then they go back in and edit exactly the way they want to. So to your point, like huge. The other thing huge. you made me think about, too, is um, this always comes up, too, because you always have some people that are more active and contribute a lot mm. more to the community. And I think it's really important to identify those people early on and find ways to work more with them. I don't know if there's some people like that already in your community, but how do you think about that with regards to like, hey, we need to really make sure we take care of this person. We really may, need to make sure we collaborate, be more, write more yeah. content, et cetera, et cetera, so they get <laughs> everyone else involved, right? I'm going to get real vulnerable here on this front. <laughs> good, good. <laughs> Here's the thing, man. It takes a while to get to those folks, right? Because those folks don't show up by accident mm -hmm. and they don't stick around by accident. 
And I thought that we could buy our way into that mm. and it did not work, right? I thought I could say when our community wasn't as engaged as I wanted it to be and it was like still in its kind of like yeah. bumpy early stages, I was like, could we, you know, we were open about it with folks. We called them like, you know, ambassadors or experts or something like that. Like we, you know, we were open about it, right? Like we even put out a JD on it, right? But like, mm. uh, could we pay people X amount of dollars a month to be super active in the community and just like bump up engagement? Sure. Right. Could we cut, could we cut the line with just cash? Mm -hmm. Right. And it fucking failed miserably. Mm. Right. Um, and maybe that works at different stages for different types of companies, but like, it's just like the incentives weren't aligned and like, you could kind of read through it. And like what it did was it took a problem. Like when you have VC cash, there's this thing where it's like, your first instinct is like throw money at stuff sometimes when it doesn't need money. It just needs thinking. Yeah. And this problem of engagement didn't need money. It needed thinking. And part of the thinking was like, well, why aren't people engaged? Is the why not strong enough? Is the content that we're putting out not strong enough? Is that things are they not relevant enough? Are we not getting the right people in? Are we not vetting the right people? Are we not getting them introduced right? Are we not having enough one-on-one -on -one time with them? Like, so what we did was we stopped doing that. And we started like answering all these really hard questions, like working with Claudia on these like really hard fucking questions where like, why are people joining? What do they want out of it? If they disengage, like what were they hoping to get that they didn't? Can we accept the fact that, you know, there's going to be a certain percentage of lurkers and like, that's all they're going to be. And like, that's all they want to do. And like, that that's okay. Right. Like, like, so it's, it's like figuring out, like rolling up your sleeves and getting into the weeds of those questions. And if you do that enough with enough intention and enough time and energy, eventually those people show up right they stick around and you give them a lot of love you send them swag right but also sure. you know you showcase them we showcase those people in our newsletter we we help we help build their personal brands they're helping build our brand internally with our community we turn right back around and go right. we're going to boost you to our 10,000 people here we're going to reshare your social stuff we're going to put you as a speaker at our conference next spring in Atlanta right like we show right back up for those people. And so they're helping our platform. So we help give them a platform too. I think that is spot on. It's, I think it's exactly the types of things that I hear that work really, really well with communities. Because if you don't do that, then they're going to get disinterested and they're going to leave. They're going to say, ah, this isn't really, I mean, I'm not really, no one's reaching out to me and I'm not getting a lot of love from this. And so I think, you know, you've got to make sure that you show attention to that. And maybe the community yeah. does that a lot for you, right? You know, hopefully that is what happens because they're creating great content, starting great conversations. And there's always going to be a percent of lurkers, right? There's nothing you can do about that. I mean, LinkedIn, you know, when you're posting on LinkedIn, the majority, vast majority of people are just sitting there not even liking. Why I love exactly. posting on LinkedIn. Yes. Yeah. All lurkers. There's so just many dying lurkers. for content. Exactly. Tons of lurkers. And so the people that like actually like and comment, like, man, that's the, that's the small percent of the bigger buck. And then even smaller, of course, with people that, you know, post weekly, but, um, well, I wanted to get to one big thing before we kind of put a wrap on this in general, and then maybe there's some sure. things I've missed too. So let me know if you want to jump around a different direction. But the one thing that always comes up with this type of thing is how do you measure success and how do you actually prove ROI and how do you get investment dollars from your CEO or CFO or someone to say, hey, this makes sense. And for you, it's probably a very different story because you are the co-founder and CEO. You believe in this. You started from the beginning. But I mean, Thinking about hey, it. Hey, Phil, should we invest in community? Exactly. Yeah, I think we'll invest in community. Exactly. <laughs> but, you know, for a lot of marketers, man, like this is exactly what's happening. And it's true for like create, uh, create demand programs, brand awareness things, anything that's kind of fuzzy and not that easy to exactly attribute directly back to some type of revenue goal. And I so got you. Everyone, everyone struggles with this, man. It's tough. So when you are trying to get investment for a community and you've got like a VP sales or a CRO, right, being like, yeah, cool. We'll give you money for a community, but how many leads are you going to get every week? Exactly. Right? That's a question. And that's not the exact thing with community. Um, what you got to do is say, let's get creative on ROIs that we can participate in that are measurable, that are definable, but it may be not exactly like the direct conversion stuff because like people read right through that shit. Right. Like exactly. we will work with you in our community, whether you're a fit for our product or not, because we totally believe in the vision of this thing. And I think that people see that and they respect that. Um, and uh, and so what I would say is like when you're thinking about ROI, say like, yeah, of course, are we going to want to drive leads? Yeah, like that, that's part of sure. Right. But 
here's some other ROIs that uh, ways to think about ROI that I could provide to you um, that would that would um, that would warrant investment in this. Um, what if I made? What if we made sure that anyone who found out about our product through an ad first found out about our community, and had that had that recognition that we were in in this beyond just the product, right? How could we get air cover on that front? Um, uh, how can we, uh, whenever we do stuff about the product and webinars for the product, can we pull speakers like from this list so it becomes way easier to find engaged and active speakers? Mm. Um, could some of the content that we create become UGC from the community so we spend less effort, money, and time and energy on that stuff? Um, could you find out on your calls, on your SDR calls, uh, you know, have you ever heard of our community or can you use our community in some of your SDR calls and see um, what is the percentage of increase on conversions on like those cold outbound emails when you're talking about community first rather than just the product? Can you use us as an asset to increase conversion rates, right? Like get creative with how you use community as an asset. Don't just think about it like, you know, does it just gather us more leads and like we're on our own island? The community strategy should be integrated into every other strategy across everything. Your ad strategy, your outbound strategy, your inbound strategy. Like if you're not asking every single person that signs up for your product if they want to join the community, you're failing, right? Um, so th that's the way that I think about it. No, I think you said it well, and I completely agree because that's the issue that I have such a problem with is that everyone's trying to measure everything the same way. And even though we're all revenue obsessed, especially now more than ever, capital's expensive. We want to make sure we spend our dollars well, et cetera. That doesn't mean that you measure every single type of program, channel, campaign the same way. Commun By how many qualified leads you can't, do we You get? can't do that. Otherwise, you'll kill a lot of those programs that are up at the top of the funnel that are doing a ton of great work that's driving people down and getting them familiar with your brand, building a relationship, right. trust, the whole nine yards, et cetera. So to your point, when they saw that, how did you hear about us form or whether they do or they don't, they're going to come in eventually because they're going to say, man, I love these guys. Their community is right. kick ass. There's awesome but people bringing there. it. Yeah. But even bringing into your sales process and say to say your SDRs, right? Or, or your ad folks, right? How, what was the difference in quality of users or like, or when you mentioned the community versus not, did that give you a lift in response rates? Right. Well then that's community working for you. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Like it, it's got to be infused into everything. Yeah. And I think that's why it's always so important with these things. You have to set expectations from the beginning before you even get into building a community to say, hey, these are going to be the things that we're going to actually evaluate success on. And maybe that's how often people come back, how many webinars and people are engaged with the webinar, the feedback you're getting from the community. We're like, oh, my God, I love this thing. Right. Or maybe it's to your point with leads, looking at the how did you hear right. about us field and saying, oh, wow, yeah, the community has been so great. I really want to figure out other ways I can work with you guys on this, so on and so forth. And Look. so you have to have those things identified in the beginning. Otherwise, you're going to get to that point two, three months in, the CEO is going to say, hey, man, uh, where What's are the leads? Here? Where's the pipe? You know, you guys said this right. whole community thing is going to generate tons of revenue and it ain't here, you know, so. Right. And I think that the people have the problem of being black and white thinking with community where it's like, yeah. Is it going to generate leads or is it just going to be vanity metrics, exactly. right? Exactly. And the reality is it, when done well, it's actually in the middle, right? right? Which is like, there are things, there are intangibles with community that drive tangible outcomes. So as an example, right, uh, as the CEO and co-founder of No Code Ops, it, it is very uncommon that I'll find someone in this space that won't want to have a hop on a one-on-one -on -one call with me because of the authority that we've built. Totally, totally. Exactly. Never had that before. It's crazy. Right. Exactly. And, and that's the thing is because you're not approaching it from like a, hey, can we do business? Can I sell you something? Can I get you on a demo? No, it's like, no. dude, you're you're just Philip and you got this cool community. Yeah. You're building great content. I'm just the guy that, you know, you probably right. know me because I've been doing this for two and a half years plus and here I am. And so and in fact, this week we're launching an extension of our community, yeah. right, that we're doing a we're doing an additional LinkedIn group. Because we get a lot of like companies asking us to hire no code operators and we get a lot of operators looking for jobs. And like you know, it didn't really make sense to do in the community because like people are just like looking for all this stuff on LinkedIn. So it just made sense to do it separately on um, as a LinkedIn group. We're literally launching a LinkedIn group that is, you know, when people apply to, we're like, we're just all it exists to do is just like help match those folks with each other. Um, and like now I get to literally reach out to folks at companies and say like, 
hey, if you're looking to hire your next person, like, uh, you know, hey, join this group for free. It also doesn't hurt that part of our, you know, MQL process, right, is like, are they hiring for another no-code operator, right? right? Like, exactly. don't get me wrong, it helps, <laughs> right? And then we're transparent about that. Like, I'm going to talk to you about operator if it makes sense, yep. if you're cool with it. But like, whether you're talking about operator or not, I'm going to give you a shit ton of value by helping you find your next operations totally. special that knows no-code. Totally. Kick-ass, man. That's awesome. Well, anything uh, that you want to leave people with, any like last minute advice, uh, things that maybe you would have done differently with building a community, anything like that, that we didn't hit on, or you think we pretty much nailed it? I oh, got it, man. Like I just, uh, I think giving it the time and attention it deserves and being patient with it are really, really important and setting those expectations with leadership around like, these are what the metrics are going to look like. And here is how we do a impact sales. Maybe not as directly as you thought, but here are the metrics that I could hold myself accountable to exactly. while doing this. Because no matter how you slice it to do community well, it's a lot of time, it's a lot of money, it's a lot of energy, no matter which way you slice and dice it. And yeah. so to get that internal buy-in, set, be the owner of that metrics and be the owner of that story and, uh, and be willing to experiment and throw things at the wall and be willing to fail mm -hmm. and like, uh, you know, treat the community like its own product because it really is. Yeah, no, I love that, man. I think it, I think you said it well. And I mean, just to add one last thing. I mean, that's why it's so important, especially for any of these like channels, campaigns, programs, et cetera, that are not capture based channels, like high intent Google ads campaigns. Those are the ones that always are going to need more time. You have to be patient with it. These are not the ones where you look day after day or week after week about leads, pipeline of revenue. Those are the things where you look at broader correlations to the data and you say, okay, wait a minute. Hmm. It's interesting. Last month, we've seen a dramatic increase in people coming in inbound, looking to talk to us. And so maybe they didn't tell you yep. exactly where they came from, but you can say, hey, this is the one big thing we did. And yeah, sure, small, smaller things might have, might have happened, but this is the one big thing. And we can pretty much say that this is probably a big indicator of why people are actually coming inbound now. And so I think that stuff's really, really And it important. takes time. It does. Interest compounds. All of a sudden, you just make, nothing's happening, it nothing's does. happening, nothing's happening. 100%. Boom. 100%. Right? Well, cool, man. Well, this is a great chat. How can people get in touch with you? What's the best way? LinkedIn, email? Yeah, uh, LinkedIn, uh, email, uh, just, you know, I'm Philip with what L at nocodeops.com. Uh, also on Twitter, at Philip Lakin. And if you want to learn more about No Code Ops and uh, Operator and our community, uh, it's just NoCodeOps.com. Love it, man. Love it, man. We'll good chat. Until next week. Cool. Have Until next guy. week. All right. Well, thanks for listening to another episode of the Demand Podcast. Again, I'm Jonathan Bland, the co-founder of Omnilab. I'll also have with me Jason Steele, who's the other co-founder of Omnilab on this podcast as well. Uh, we're a demand gen agency for C to Series B SaaS startups. Um, if you like this episode, uh, or you're looking for some help with the Mangen, please feel free to reach out to us on LinkedIn over a DM, or you can go just directly to our website, that's omnilabconsulting.com. Otherwise, uh, we look forward to seeing you on the next episode where we'll be talking about all things Demandgen. Until then, thanks. Bye-bye.